Well, um, some of you know, most of you know, um, maybe you even saw it on the way out uh, by now that I actually have a VW van. And if you, it, it's not the first one that I've had. This is actually, if I'm counting correctly, the seventh um, van that I've ever had uh, VW wise um, and some of them nicer than others. But um, I'm using this uh, thought today about used parts. Um, if ever there's something that every vintage car uh, driver knows, it's the importance of the used um, part swap meet. This is where you go and you meet other people who maybe have the part that you're missing, you know, and things like that. And so, again, the one that I have right now, we call her Daisy, uh, but she certainly is is very sweet, and and yet I've had other ones that came before, you know, and I and she knows that, so she's not she's not too jealous, but. One of my personal faves from the past um, was a pop-up camper that we had. Um, and, and this is now going back 25 years, okay? So the 25 years ago that we had this one. And I bought it for a few hundred dollars. It was actually pulled out of uh, a, a person's backyard, right? It, it was that, that thing that every car uh, enthusiast dreams of, uh, of actually finding that thing under the tarp. But the dream wasn't quite like the dream. Because in the dream, you pull the tarp away and it's like at three miles on it. And it's been perfectly taken care of. Well, this wasn't quite like that. This one was more like, oh, wow. Uh, it was like dust and rust held together with duct tape. Um, but all the same, I was in love. And so, um, so I, we got that car. And soon after I got it, I actually, to, to try to keep the bumper on, I stuck several bumper stickers. If you've ever wondered why old Volkswagen uh, always have bumper stickers, it's to hold them together. Uh, but but the, the bumper sticker there actually said, please honk if something falls off. Um, it, the idea was that if somebody behind me like saw something, you know, go tumbling off to the side, uh, they would at least honk and let me know, you know. And, and several times, uh, I was really only half joking because uh, more than once I pulled into the driveway to find that some part that I had left the driveway with was no longer with me. You know, it was just kind of like, oh, there. The, I thought I heard something when that door handle and the person was honking, and I thought we were waving to each other a trim piece or a hubcap or whatever. And so when you think about this. Again, used parts, very, very important. And we came uh, from Miami most recently, uh, but there's a place in Miami that's an amazing place. And, and I say this with all the love in my heart, it's a place called Hialeah. It was actually one of my favorite places to go and to go through and everything. But I'm, I'm telling you, Hialeah is like, um, like if you just took Cuba and like transported it right into the middle of the United States and just didn't change anything. This is, this is Hialeah, right? And so if you make a scene in Hialeah, you have done something. Like if you can get people to stop and stare and go, <gasps> you know, or whatever, you, you, because everyday life is so crazy in Hialeah that, that to go outside that norm is to really do something. And there was a time when I was driving our, our little bus through uh, Hialeah and all of a sudden, it's, I started hearing a banging sound, like bang, 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 you know, louder than normal, right? <laughs> and then it started smoking more than usual, you know, and all the rest. And, and there was like just a lot going on. And so I, people in Hialeah were stopping and looking. And, and I do, to this day, I take great pride in the fact that I caused a scene in Hialeah. But, but there it was that, that bus that had so many used parts and so many things that were falling off of it. I managed to somehow limp that van home on only two cylinders. Now, if you're not mechanically inclined, there's only four cylinders in a, in a Volkswagen bus, and there's only 40 horsepower in it, which probably a lawnmower these days has more than most of that. So when I, you're half of that, you are barely making it. So I, I was seriously just shaking, smoking, and banging all the way home, and, and managed to like coast this van into the driveway uh, where it basically stayed until it went to Volkswagen heaven. Uh, a, a person came and, and picked it up and, and got, um, I got parts. It became a parts car. Now, I think about it even to this day. I wish I had, had not lost heart on this car, because I did. I lost heart. Because the part that was lost um, the part that was lost was an engine part. You know, the whole engine pretty much blew up on the way home. And um, when I think about that, in the same way, our, our body is made up of many parts, right? And sometimes we assign physical parts sort of spiritual significance, right? So somebody will talk about someone's 
mind or heart or, or whatever. Or, and we're talking about more than just the organ, right? I mean, we're talking about like if somebody is disheartened or they lose heart or something like that. We're not just saying that they, they physically died, which, which might be possible, but a sorry uh, truth in many people's lives is that they actually, they die before they die, right? There's something inside them that, that dies and maybe they had a hopefulness at one point and it turns over to a hopelessness. And so when I think about this, in my life anyway, I could probably put that bumper sticker on me. I'm 51 this year. Um, you know, I could put, uh, please honk if something falls off. Uh, because there are times when there's things that are disheartening, you know? You're like, oh man, wow, uh, I was, wow. I, I, you know, I did, my arm didn't fall off, but it felt like it was going to. You know, there's things in, in your life sometimes that you go, I definitely, if anyone's seen my mind lately, if you could please just let me know where I left it. I can't find it without my glasses, you know, and that's the irony of life too, is your eyes go and then you can't find your glasses without your glasses, which is just this circular stupidity of life. And so the heart part, again, the heart part is what I want to talk with you about today, that the heart part is a part you can't afford to lose. Um, it's a part I can't afford to lose. If we lose heart in everything that that means in life, man, you know what? I can lose a tooth. I can lose a finger or a toe. Um, you know, my sister just broke her toe this last week, but she still went on vacation. She didn't care. She just said, well, I'll, I'll just sit in the sand and put my feet up and, and wrap my big toe. Uh, but, you know, you can lose a lot of things in life and still make it. But if you lose your heart, physically speaking, you're probably not going to make it, right? That's a part you can't live without for very long. And so I wrote down this thought, again, with used parts. One of the things that will happen to you in your life is if you're used of God, you will often feel used by people. This was just a, a thought I was reflecting on this week because... You know, almost everyone on some level, if you believe in God, you, you also believe it would be really cool to be used of God. Used of God to encourage someone, used of God to uh, maybe mentor somebody in some way. Some, sometime later in life, someone would say, you are so instrumental in my life. I mean, I think of people who were instrumental in my life. I mean, I own a guitar, but I, I actually play the drums. So drums is a... a, a instrument I'm more comfortable in but but I think of the things that somebody taught me to play the drums and what's cool is I taught some people to play the drums and they actually went further than I ever did and so it's a really cool thought that God used my life for somebody else's life you know there have been people who've said something you said or a story you told or a, a, a teaching you gave once actually impacted me and, and made a difference in my life and I go man that's awesome to be used of God but you know what's not awesome to be used by people. I mean in a negative way, right? I, I actually kind of threw this slide out of here because it's an interesting thought that used can be good or bad, right? A used thing, it, you go, man, I was used of God. And you go, that's, that's so cool, I was utilized. But then there's times when somebody's used you and you feel kind of brutalized through that. It's kind of like, man, I am like defeated and deflated and kind of deleted out of that person's life. And you go, I, man, I, I feel like I, my heart gets ripped out when that happens, you know, when that happens in your life. And so when you think about it, again, it's an amazing thing to be used of God. But when we look at this passage, Paul was writing it from the perspective of somebody who was somewhat heartbroken. He was somebody who had, you know, found it <laughs> wonderful to be used of God, and yet at the same, same time, horrible to be used by people. See, and I wrote down this, again, the heart part is a hard part, to use and not lose. You know when they say use it or lose it? Well, you know what? When someone uses you, if God uses you, it can really hearten you, right? I mean, it's like, ah, there's, there's purpose, there's meaning, there's, there's something that I'm driving toward. People matter and I matter to people and all that stuff. And then it can be really, really disastrous in our life when somebody comes along and, you know, basically they used you. You know, they took what they could take from you they gave as little as possible, and maybe you gave everything you had to that relationship. Maybe it's as a parent, and you just pour into something, and you go, man, what do I get in return? It's disheartening sometimes. And so what I want to talk with you about today is how not to lose the heart part. How not to lose the heart part. The same way that, that bus, again, got carried away to 
to Volkswagen Heaven. I, I kind of fantasize on some level that the one I have now has some part from that bus. It, it's the same year. It's kind of funny. All these years later, maybe, just maybe, uh, one of those parts that was sold off in Hialeah actually made it to this bus. But if you think about that, again, all it takes in my life for my heart to stop, you know, uh, is a couple of missed beats. I mean, you think about the importance of that. I, I could, you know, you ever had your um, hand go to sleep when you're asleep, you know, you wake up and you've been on it or something and you're like, ah, you know, and it hurts and everything else. But it's like, oh, my hand was asleep. I don't know how long that happened. But if my heart goes to sleep, yikes. Um, again, you think about it, you can feel faint and you can feel uh, lightheaded just from some little tiny heart problem. And so again, when the, when the Bible says this in the Proverbs, it's a great one. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, meaning this is very important, guard your heart. Guard your heart because from it is the wellspring of life. Again, when you think about how important it is physically, the things that we ascribe to it spiritually are even more important. Uh, your spiritual life can't afford to miss too many beats, you know. And when you think about this, guarding your heart is not talking about that muscle. It's talking about a message to us. What happens when a person doesn't guard their heart? Well, they can find themselves fainting, uh, fading you know, just kind of barely there. You know that weird feeling when the world just kind of closes in on you uh, because you're, you're about to lose consciousness? Well, guess what? Spiritually speaking, someone can have that same sense of just everything closing in on them. And you say, don't lose heart. That's what Paul is saying here. And this is the idea, again, so important. And I love 2 Corinthians as we go into this first verse here of chapter 4. Uh, what's great about this book is that it's a very personal book. I've said that each time, but I think it's so important to remember that Paul, that some people think, you know, he's in stained glass, right? He's Saint Paul, whatever that means. He was kind of like, I'm just Paul. <laughs> I mean, a lot of days I'm ain't Paul. I, I'm not Saint Paul. I just barely making it. There's times where I'm like on two cylinders, <laughs> just trying to make it home, you know, and, and that's what you see in here. He lost a lot of things in his life. He lost friends. He lost finances. He lost a position of power. He was a guy who prior to coming in contact with Christ, he had really it made in a worldly sense. He was a guy who was uh, at the top of his belief system. He was, uh, you know, a guy that everyone would have wanted his autograph. He was just a really cool, prominent person. And he chucked all that and said, you know what? My heart wasn't in it. My heart wasn't in it. And, and when you think about this, he, he went to prison. Um, he was beaten. He was shipwrecked. All kinds of crazy stuff happened to his life. And it would have been really easy for him to become disheartened. It would have been easy for him to give up, to give in, to become bitter, to become cynical, and somehow he didn't. And so I learned from lives like that. And I think, you know, when you, when you think about this simple thought, the heart part is a hard part, not for it to grow hard in your life. That the longer you go on, you go, you know, hardening, hardening of the arteries, it happens in our life too. You know, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot because you're, you're here for the first time, but that's the perfect time to put someone on the spot. You guys both are freshmen, which I love that idea. You're freshmen at Davidson. Fresh, fresh, man. It's just fresh. And life is fresh. And then if, if what am I? I'm stale, man. I'm a stale man. Um, you know, it ain't fresh. The bread has been baked. You know, I mean, there's a point where you go, oh, to be a freshman. Oh, man, to be studying things, to be seeing things, the excitement and joy of youth. And you go, man, but, but Paul was a guy toward the end of his life. He didn't let it get stale, man. He kept it fresh. And I say, that is so beautiful. That's what I want. I want to learn that. So 2 Corinthians 4, 1, here it is. He says, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we've received mercy, we don't lose heart. You'll see that phrase twice in this chapter, don't lose heart, don't lose heart. What it literally means when you look at the language underlying it, it says it means to fall down in exhaustion. It just basically means, you know, to pass out to faint. And I don't know if you've ever felt, again, just like passing out in life. Uh, more than just physically, where you're just like, I'm out. 
I'm just out. I'm done. I'm exhausted. I've had it. This is it. That's all I can take. I, I can't take no more. I'm going, I can't go on, you know? And you think about this, if that's you, if it's ever been you, uh, this is a perfect chapter for you. Because this is the chapter that says you can go on when you can't go on. Well, you you want to know how to go on when you can't go on? Here's how. A, a handful of things that keep us from losing heart completely. And the first is found there in verse 1, and I, I, I share it with you this way. Again, we won't lose heart if we live by mercy instead of merit. These are two really important words for you to think on. You know, as a student, I'm a teacher, but as... A, students you know sometimes students who live by achievement by by merit you know it can actually get pretty pressure filled it can come to the point where you're like man i don't think i add up i don't think i stack up and for a time in your life if you're if you're getting those things and you're just sucking away win 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 i'm just all the time uh, you know better than last test I, and then you get that test back that you go yikes mercy you know you're going in to talk with the teacher and saying mercy is there any mercy or is it all by merit see and you think about this many people have a very legalistic approach to god and they think of god as one who lays down the law and the rules and the regulations and they kind of warm to that on some level of life because you get a couple of things right and you start going yeah i'm pretty right and everyone else is pretty wrong i'm going to pull myself up by my bootstrap and straps i'm going to you know just be that person who merits life and good things will happen to me because I'll do good things and all that sort of stuff. And then you pull yourself up by your bootstrap someday and the strap comes off in your hand and you're like, whoa, what, what happened? You know, and slaps you in the face and all that kind of stuff. And you're like, wait, I was, I was deserving of so much more. I was earning so much more in life. And you know what? I think about this. Paul contrasts it in verse 1. He says, we've received mercy. I don't know if you remember last week, but I, I shared a thought, which was achieved glory fades, received glory grows. You know, achieved glory is that thing where you set some goal and you hit it or you exceed it, and you're like, yeah. And then somehow over life, it can be very disheartening when you run your personal worst rather than your personal best, right? That time where you're like, all right, this is the time where I'm going to outdo myself last time. And you're like, oops, I, I didn't do it. And then, oh, well, I just, I was feeling a little sick that day. And then pretty soon you realize, no, my, actually, I'm, I'm not achieving at a level I used to achieve, but I can receive at a level I've never received, which is, you know what? Hey, I need help. Hey, uh, you know what? Frankly, I don't have it all together. And then you connect with somebody and realize, oh, you don't have it all together either? Man, because we were trying to impress each other with our merit, where I would rather be heartened by somebody's mercy. See, I think about this again. Mercy is the opposite of merit, right? Merit is earned, deserved, self-worth, all of these things. And mercy is this great thing of grace when you realize God loves me because of who he is, not because of who I am. See, if he only loves me when I'm on my good days, then what about my bad days, which might be more and more sometimes. And so when I think about this, living by merit will eventually cause you to faint. It'll cause you to fail. When you fail, your heart will fail because uh, oh, I'm a failure. No, you're not. No more, no more than you ever were. And so you think about this, living in God's mercy is such a great way to live. We won't lose heart. Listen to Corey Tim Boom. She is an amazing voice toward this. Uh, a Holocaust survivor, a person who went to the deepest depths of nastiness that life has ever been able to dish out to anyone. If ever there was a person who could have le lost the heart part through all of that, I mean, come on, a concentration camp. Think about it. She had family members murdered and, and, and abused and, and everything right in front of her. She had the, the worst parts of humanity in her everyday experience. And you think about something she said. She said this after she got out. Trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, exhausting, and tedious work of all. But when you just go with God's strength, then ministry just kind of flows out of you. She's a person saying, hey, you know what? <laughs> I've received mercy through all of this. She was also a person who's, who's given me another quote that I've gotten lots of mileage out of, which is she said, there is no pit darker 
that God's light is not deeper still. No, nothing so deep that God's light, it, no darkness so deep that God's light is not deeper still. And you think about this, this is a person who lived in the, in the deepest of pits. So when you think about that, again, what are used parts? Well, she was used of God, but she was used by people. There were people who just threw her away as if she was nothing. And it would have been very easy for her if she thought her merit and her worth and her value was based on people's valuation of her. It would have been really easy for her to grow very bitter. And yet she didn't. And so I think about this. This is where Paul said we got it. Last verse, he said that we get it by, uh, by observing the life of Jesus. See, I think about Jesus. Wasn't he a guy greatly used of God? I think he was. <laughs> but you know what? He was brutalized also. He was utilized. <laughs> you think about a guy who hugged lepers, a guy who you know, preached hope to people and everything else, and what happened to him? Well, it didn't always go beautiful for him. There were people who just basically used him for their own political achievements. There were people who, it says that people did things to him out of envy. It says that he was a person who would heal somebody and people didn't bother to come back and say thanks. He was a guy who, uh, he, he gave out free meals at one point and, and he even told people, you're just following me for the free meal, you're not following me for the message. You don't care anything about what I just told you, which is go do what I'm doing for you, go do it for other people. Like if you have two, give them one of your two. Um, and, and he says, but you didn't do that. All you did is said more for me, more for me, more for me, more for me. So he was a guy who knew what it was to be used of God, but he knew what it was to be used by people. And so Jesus could have left, lost heart. Corey Tim Boom could have lost heart. Paul the Apostle could have lost heart. Lynn, my wife, could have lost heart. You know, people in this room could lose heart. But we won't lose heart if we live by mercy and not merit, which is, hey, I don't deserve it. That person didn't deserve it. None of us deserve it. But if I want to be used of God, I won't brutalize people with things. I'll let God utilize me and keep putting things into my life, even if people are taking it out. So you think about this, the second one, this is really awesome. We won't lose heart if we live for Christ and not Christianity. See, this could be misunderstood, but listen to what I'm saying here in verse 2. He says, but, and believe me, I am going to step on the gas. We'll make it through the chapter. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, or handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. What he's saying there is, I'm letting people judge me. <laughs> They're able to look at me and say, well, that guy's a fraud. Or that guy reminds me of God. See, even if our gospel is veiled, he said, it's veiled to those who are perishing, the minds, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who don't believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God, should shine on them. We don't preach ourselves, but Christ, the Lord, and ourselves, your servant, for Jesus' sake. Now, I think about that. Think about just this thought right here. We don't preach ourselves. Um, I'm not here to run down preachers, but I've been one, and I've known many. And you know what? Preachers love to preach themselves. Oh, uh, well, uh, you know, I'm the anointed man of God and blah, 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 blah. And I know everything and you know nothing and all that kind of stuff. They love to do it. They love to get my book, get my teaching series, get all this stuff. They love to teach themselves and to preach themselves. But this is where he says, don't do that. It's not about manipulation. It's not about salesmanship. It's not about trying to get people to your side of the aisle on things. He says it's, it's basically to say Jesus is great. And you know what? He said the greatest are the servant of all. So how can I help you? Can, I, can my life be of any service to you? Not how can you serve me? The question is how can I serve you? How can I serve you? And again, when I think about that, asking that question is an interesting one because many times you walk into a church and they basically ask, how can you serve this church? Um, what can you do for us? Um, what skills do you have? What things can you do? Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. And somebody taught me many years ago to just ask, what can we do for you? Is there anything we can do for you? Um, and, and when you think about that, You'll lose heart if you live for Christianity. What a mess Christianity is. What a mess it's been. What 
terrible things have been done in the name of Christianity over the years. I mean, honestly, I was talking with the kids in the Bible class I teach over there the other day, and I told them, I don't care what Christians think. I do not care in the poll what Christians think. Oh, well, Christians feel this way. I do not care. I care what Christ did. I do care about that very much. And you know what? Living for Christianity is a disaster. Um, how many people have disheartened me with their claim of Christianity and then their game of Christianity where you're just like, oh, man, wow. You know, you read about it. it these things are not theoretical to me because so many of the people that I've walked closely with have become, even in some cases, national news because of their nasty news. And I go, yuck. That's gross. You know what? And Christianity, uh, Christ, aren't they the same thing? Not really. See, when I think about this, there are a lot of, th there's a lot of junk that goes on in the name of Jesus. Um, just about every year, Christians get really excited about various things. One of the things they get excited about is whether you say happy holidays or not. So in our family, you know, we, I, 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 I was saying the other day, I, my family knows how sarcastic I am. I make fun of things, and then people actually do what I'm making fun of, and the worse. You know, so I'm like, I told my wife, when the jokes that I make become the jukes that people do, uh, it's time for me to retire. You know, I was like making the craziest concepts up, and then it came out in the national news that this is what Christians think. And I was like, ah! You know, it just, it made me go nuts. It was so, it was so bad. You know, because again, it's like, someone will say, oh, happy holidays. And you go, it's not a holiday, it's a holy day. You know, and you go, oh, uh, sorry. Um, you know, and, and how is that drawing somebody into the life of Christ? You know, it, it's like, well, I'm, I'm searching the cup. The coffee cup has signs of sin. I know it does. And I'm like, I made fun of this stuff and then it came out in the news and I'm like Bleh. so I would lose heart if I was if I was following Christianity I would lose heart I would lose heart my friends the used parts when people have been used and abused and thrown to the side in the name of Christianity it would break anyone's heart but that's not what Jesus is about see I think about this Many hypocrites, and there's lots of different brands, but many hypocrites somewhere um, say, you know, well, uh, I, don't, I don't go follow Christ because this and that and the other. And I go, well, that's a, that's a brand of hypocrisy. Um, you know, because there's people who say, well, I don't, I don't go because, uh, you know, I, I used to, I tried Jesus, but it, it didn't work. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe you tried Christianity and it didn't work, but uh, you didn't. You didn't try Christ and it didn't work because it's not of work. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's him working his love throughout somebody's life. You know, when I think about that, there's just no way. It's, a, it's not a product that doesn't work. If, if you preach yourself, if I preach me, um, you know, Pastor Scott's got the answers. And again, if you follow me, you will get it all right. You should get disillusioned with that fairly quickly. Uh, but if I preach Christ and he lets you down, man, I, somehow I let you down. I didn't point you enough to him, and I pointed you too much to something else. See, I think about this. You won't lose heart if you live for Christ. You will lose heart if you lose for Christianity. Um, bumper stickers, while I think of them, I'm going to see if I can find this one, but I, like, I liked it when I saw it. It was in huge letters. It said, Jesus, save me. And then underneath it said, from your followers, in little font. You know, because it, it's true. I mean, there's times where I'm like, ah, you're going to run away from people. But isn't it true that even his followers in the New Testament, um, they were like, you want us to burn this city to the ground because they didn't listen to your message? And he said, I don't, I'm not sure you guys listened to my message, actually. Uh, but no, we're really not in the burn it to the ground ministry. Guys, um, you really don't know what I'm doing here. Um, there were times when he'd like go have to dismiss the disciples, right? You know this story where he was 
talking to a lady at a well, right? And she would have been an outcast for the society. And she was everything wrong in their society. She was uh, a, a woman of ill repute. She was a woman. And, and then she was also a, a woman from another race. And they didn't like that. And so he had to send them, hey, guys, why don't you followers go into town and have lunch while I minister to this lady? And they came back and said, what's he doing talking to her? Again, when you think about it, if you're following Christianity, yikes. Following Christ is a good thing. You'll lose heart if you follow Christians. So you think about this, verse 6. It's, it's God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who's shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. I don't know if, about you, but I think we live in dark days. I mean, you know, I'm sure the dark ages were dark, but these are, to me, a second type of dark ages sometimes there's things that i look at and i go really i mean just uh, i can't i i really almost can't read the news unless it's in in cartoon font i really can't i mean there's just a point of me that goes I, i can't do it because it's just grieving to my heart you know and and i think about that and i think how easy it would be to have a hard heart at this point to just say you know what forget it forget it forget everybody you know, who cares if I'm used by God or used of God? Who cares? I'm not going to let anybody use me ever again, you know. But in verse 6, Paul compares our heart condition before Christ to darkness. It's Genesis 1.1. I love the way that it says, you know, in the beginning there was nothing kind of except God, and God spoke into nothing and made it something. And I go, you know, I love science, uh, and, and I think science and God get along fine. Um, and, and, and this is it. I mean, God understands science, right? He's pretty good at it. Um, and, and he spoke light into existence. And you go, man, that's great. Because dark isn't a thing. Dark is the absence of a thing, right? And so when you think about it, he didn't speak darkness into existence. Darkness was, and light was made into it. And so I think about that in my own life. It can be very tempting to curse the darkness, you know? Remember that old saying, better to light a candle than curse the darkness? Most people don't believe that this day, these days. Let's curse the darkness, you know, in Jesus' name. And you go, no, no. Light a light. Darkness isn't even a thing. It's the absence of a thing. It's the absence of God working in a place. It's an absence of people bringing the light of Christ into something. And so, you know, I don't really get worked up, again, about Christian issues and Christian positions and all that kind of stuff. I don't think Paul really did. Jesus was constantly being recruited to different sides of our arguments. Have you ever noticed that in the New Testament? They're always like, well, solve this problem between my brother and I. Who's right, me or him? And all this stuff. And Jesus says, who, who made me the arbitrator of your problem? I'm not getting involved in that. Isn't it funny? I mean, they're like, well, Caesar says this and the Jews say that. What do you think? And he says, well, what do you think? And so I think it's very interesting that light, 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 just turning the light on is such an important thing, living for Christ, not for Christianity. Now, number three, this is a good one, I think. Look at this one. We will lo- not lose heart if we look at our content and not containers, and not just our content, but other people's content and containers. See, it's very tempting to look at parts, right? But again, my parts are getting more and more used. So if anyone was impressed with any part of me at any point in my life, well, it, you know, it, it's not as impressive as it used to be. Um, so I think about this. He says this, we have treasure in earthen vessels, not that the excellence of power may be of us, but of God. He says earthen pestles, earthen pestles, earthen vessels. It means a clay pot. That's what it's talking about. You know, they, they, they didn't have like the steel and the copper and all that stuff and teflon pants they had things made out of clay right they just made clay and if you had something of extreme value you would make a little jar for it and you would put that thing of value in that jar but guess what the jar was just dirt it was just mud it's just clay so you might have gold in a clay pot you might have diamonds in a clay pot there were times where they had perfume that was so difficult to make they it took like a year's wages to make this thing and it was put in a little earthen vessel just a little thing and they'd wear it here and when that thing was broken out would come the thing of value 
And you think about this, this is the picture Paul's painting. He's saying God's put the important stuff in your life, in my life, in other people's life on the inside, not the outside. And yet we are so geared toward valuing the outside, right? You look at a, a, a car, like a Volkswagen bus, and people go, oh, look at that old rust bucket. Man, that rust bucket's taken me to glorious places. I've traveled all over the place in a Volkswagen bus. When I think about that, the, the value is on the inside when my family's in there and the dog's in there and our, our stuff's in there and we're just going somewhere. It's not the value of the van, my friends. It's not the rust or the dust or the duct tape or the stuff on that. It's, it's not the container, it's the content. It's the content, and this is what he's saying, the heart part, the treasure that you see in people. You either treasure people for who they are on the inside, or you dismiss them for what they are on the outside. Again, as people age, whatever value society put on them at a younger age, because, well, they were athletic, or they were cute, or they were whatever, and you go, hey, I hate to tell you, but the heart part, the insides, age but so does everything else and you think about this it would seem very strange at first to think of putting something priceless inside of something that's just a junky jar but I don't know if you guys enjoy art I do I've been to many different art uh, exhibits here in town and and they have them you know of course all over the world but there was a, a painting recently sold for 450 million dollars I think it was I I I was out of the bidding at a million. I, I, I was like, I, Lynn, can, can I go to a million five? And she said no. Um, so th whoever got it, they got it at 450. But, um, but I'm saying that to say that, you know what they don't do with paintings like that? You've been to different places all over the world. They don't put them in super fancy, crazy frames. In fact, most priceless art is unframed. Like when you go to it, it's... It, it's got a, a, a thing over it to protect it in some ways, or sometimes it's just there. But it doesn't have a neon thing saying, Mona Lisa, you know, and uh, all this kind of stuff. That's the cheap one outside that the guy's telling you, it's the other Mona Lisa. There were two painted, and this is the other one. And I'm going to let you have it today for such and such price. But, and look at the cool frame it comes in. You know, and the Mona Lisa smiles in neon or something, and you're like, cheap things are like that. They have, to, they have to be all impressive on the outside because they forgot that the value was on the inside. See, and I think about this, a friend once told me that the, uh, the higher the gloss, the cheaper the mer merchandise. You know, and you, you think about that and you go, man, a vessel's value comes from its content. It's the inside. And this is what Paul is saying. He says, we're hard pressed on every side. I don't know if anyone ever has felt hard pressed, you know? He says, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed. It's like, uh, don't know what to do. But not in despair. He says, you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to get disheartened. We're persecuted. He said, man, I've been punched around pretty good, but I'm not forsaken. God has not forgotten me. And he says, I'm struck down, but not destroyed. So what Paul's talking about there in this passage is what happens to our earthen vessels. They get banged around pretty good. Again, honk if something falls off. Because there is a point in my life where I kind of look at it and I go, I'm pretty hard pressed sometimes. You say, well, this is Davidson. How hard could it get? Well, you know, ask a David, Davidson College freshman how hard it could get. It can get pretty hard sometimes. Perplexing, persecuted, struck down. There are things that people say that are extraordinarily difficult and grieving to our heart see i i'll take a i'll take a physical punch sometimes off of a gut a, a gut punch you know what i'm talking about with a gut punch it ha this it happened this week there's just a guy that i really really admire and he he's just going through a difficult time and and just seeing him i was so grieved i was just disheartened in a way i was like why is a guy that amazing having a time this difficult He's got such a treasure inside and he could barely straighten up because of some of the pain physically in his life. And, and yet he's still trying to help kids. I mean, he was like helping them with their math and his hand was shaking from the pain. He ended up in the ER later that night. And I was like, ah, it's a jar of clay. I mean, he's, he's younger than I am. And I, it just, it, 
things in his life, both physically and otherwise, have taken a toll on him. And I was thinking about this, and he's saying, you know what? We're not destroyed. I want to put a couple pictures in your mind. I like to do this. When I was a kid, I had a toy that I loved, and I actually got to meet um, a, some famous people in my life. So I'm, this is a picture of this famous person. Um, I don't know if you can see it there on the screen. That's Bozo the Clown. Um, yeah, big fan. Um, I, I, he and I, uh, he, he was very prominent when I was growing up, Bozo the Clown. And there was this thing that was an inflatable punching bag, an inflatable Bozo the Clown punching bag. And this was what I wanted for Christmas. I don't want it now. Please don't get it for me. Um, but, but this is what I had growing up and I actually got this picture taken with Bozo because I saw it in a place and I'm like wow this is this is where probably the one my mom gave away at a garage sale but it had a weight at the bottom this is how Bozo worked some of you may remember it if you've ever seen it it had like a sandbag at the bottom and then you blew Bozo up right and and then you could just he had a red nose he had a red nose with a, a squeaker in it I mean talk about you know this is good training for kids right beat up Bozo you know if, you, if, you, if you're getting bullied just take it out on Bozo and so this is what I did growing up I, I, I did a lot of, of boxing with Bozo and and you would punch Bozo in the yeah you, you're saying suddenly many things make sense um, but but that squeak, it was just like, ah, you know, and it, it was very therapeutic. But he never lost a fight. This is what I want you to know. Bozo always won. Why? No matter how hard you hit him, he'd come back. And the harder you hit him, that weight at the bottom, he'd flip back out and hit you in the face. And I was like, man, it was amazing. He had this like permanent Bozo smile on. And I never won a fight with that clown. I think about it. You can't keep a good clown down, right? I know clowns are, are, are scary these days, but they weren't in those days. They were nice and, and friendly. They were not the thing of nightmares. But a second picture, just thinking about it, was another toy from my past. And I don't know if you guys ever played with these, but there was something called a Weeble. Anybody know what a Weeble is? It had a commercial. If you go back and look at the 70s commercials, it was Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Weevils wobble, but they don't fall down. It was just a little plastic figurine that had the same concept. It had this weight at the bottom. And no matter what you did with it, you could knock it over, you could mess it around, you could throw it off of things, and it would always land upright. It just was an amazing little simple toy. And so when I think about that, this is the picture that I want to put into your mind of your own life which is that when you have a foundation, when you have a weight, when you have a gravity to you, the gravity that God gives to a person, where it's like, you know what? Life's gonna bust you in the, in the red nose sometimes and just, you know, and there's this resilience in somebody who just says, what else you got? <laughs> to life, kind of like, what else you got? Um, weebles, we are weeble people, where it's like God says, you know what? I'm gonna put something in your life in your faith, in your hope, in your trust, in your mercy, in your grace. Those are weighty things that if you're missing that, you'll be struck down and destroyed. You'll be defeated and deleted. But see, again, if somebody doesn't lose heart, it's because you go, well, hey, I've been used by people. I have been mistreated by life. I've been tossed around by all kinds of stuff. But guess what? I've been used of God. And if that terrible circumstance can be of any use to my own spiritual growth and anyone else's, well, then I'm back. I'm back. And you think about that, again, it, it's not a simple thing. It's not simplifying suffering. It's, it's making sense of it in some ways. This is what he's saying. We're just clay pots, man. But we have something of eternal value. You do. I do. We do. Everyone you meet. And you never know what somebody's been through. Again, you might look at someone and say, that guy's a clown. But you know what? Maybe they've been pushed down pretty hard. Maybe they've been knocked down pretty hard. And, and sometimes it's, it's getting back to that content and saying, well, I'm not going to learn, lose heart because I look around at some people and I think, if I just look at it from the outside, there's not much there. But maybe, maybe if I were to focus on people's content a little bit more, I'd see more. In it, And this is what he says in verse 10, always carrying around the in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in us. 
For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is working in us, but life is in you. What is he saying? He's saying things that are hurting me are helping you. Um, and you know what? Things that might be hurting you are helping me. Because when you really look at this, again, it's so easy to lose heart. It's so easy to have parts fall out of our life. But sometimes something has to be crushed for you to see what's on the inside. See, for every New Testament principle, there's an Old Testament picture. It's one of the reasons I like to look at the whole Bible. But you have to look at it through the lens of understanding that Jesus brought to it, or unless you go off on crazy tangents. But there's a guy named Gideon in Judges 7, and maybe you know the story, but his army was like vastly outnumbered. It's a cool story. And God comes to Gideon, the leader, and he says, hey, Gideon, um, we got a problem with the numbers in the army. And Gideon's like, thank you. I'm glad you finally noticed we got a problem with the recruitment, man. We need more. And God says, no, you need less. You need fewer. You need fewer soldiers than you have right now. Because if you win now, and you will win, because... I'm going to see to it that you win. But he said, here's the problem. If you win with more soldiers than they have, you'll say, we're a pretty good army. But if you guys win with no army, you'll be amazed at how people will give the glory to God. And he's like, well, I have no idea how we won. <laughs> In fact, we were headed for a loss. So this is what God does. God whittles down the number. He says, if any of you want to go home, you should go home. And, and Gideon's probably hoping like three people will leave, but three people are left, basically. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like, all right, if anyone's scared, just go on home. Well, not all of you at once. I, no, what I said is if you don't want to fight tomorrow, go ahead. Uh, you know, and they all leave pretty much. And there's a few left. And then God gives Gideon the battle plan. And you can imagine, this is what I would have been thinking. I would have been thinking bazookas. God's going to have rocket launchers or some kind of really cool weapon that he hasn't told anyone about yet. And he's going to say, I just kept the secret for the four of you. But you know what it was? He says, here it is, a clay pot and a candle. And Gideon's like, is it too late for me to leave? You remember that deal where you could leave if you were scared? Can I go now? Can I go now? Because I'm losing heart now. Because you gave me a, a clay pot and a candle, God. And, and, and there's the enemy over there. And they have a lot more than clay pots and candles. And, and so this is what he says. I want you to break the clay pot and let the light shine out. Now, again, if you just look at these Old Testament stories and go, wow, that's children's ministry stuff. It's not, my friends. These are deep deep spiritual truths that you go like what happened the light confused and scattered the enemy when you think about this darkness you can't fight darkness with darkness you can't fight fire with fire all of these silly things that you can't fight hate with hate we'll lose heart if we try to do that where do I not lose heart when I see when I see God's weapons of light, love, mercy, grace, peace, still win when we're radically outnumbered. Radically outnumbered. That's when I go, wow, God. If I'd been looking at my own resources, I would have lost heart. Um, if I was looking at, at, at containers instead of contents, I would have lost heart. I'm just, uh, <laughs> I'm just an earthen vessel. What do I know? Well, I know this. I have seen amazing things done with people who had a treasure inside that refused to go out. I just refused to go out. You can beat them, and you beat them, and on some level, you beat it out of them. And it comes, better things come out of them. And you're like, how can this be? I, this was a mystery to me. And again, I, stepping on the gas here as we head toward the end. He, uh, there's, a, there's a friend of, of ours who, I, I started noticing this pattern that some of my favorite people had been through the worst things in life. Like I didn't know them that well. And I'd go, man, I like this person. This person's so cool. They're so gentle to other people. They're so thoughtful of other people. They're so uh, just others oriented. They're just so upbeat. They're like, they're wonderful people. And then I would find out a little bit about their backstory. And it was, it was almost always just horrible. I mean, horrible of, of the most horrible things someone can imagine. And, you'd, and they didn't just walk around going, hi, um, my life's been horrible. No, in fact, they're like, man, I, I've, I've been used of God. Boy, have I been used to used by people. It's, it's been brutal. It's, there's been some brutalization there. And I asked myself, well, why is that? Why do the best people 
have the worst things happen to them. And then I think God gave me a tiny insight. Maybe it'll, it's helpful. I don't know. But it was, that's what made them that way. It was through that grinder that out of that came the fine powder that it wasn't like like ground, uh, for want of a better thing, ground beef. I mean, you can't mold a, a T-bone steak, but ground beef is pretty moldable. And, and it was amazing the thought that someone who's been through the grinder is oftentimes... Well, some people blame it for why they're horrible people, why their heart grew hard and why they lost the heart part. And Paul's here saying, man, it was the grinder that actually ground me up and gave me grace. And so I thought about that and I said, it's not just a coincidence, it's the process. It's the process by which amazing people become amazing people. It's also the process by which some very, very angry people become very, very angry. But it's the decision there, right? And so this is what he's saying. He's saying you won't lose heart if you do this. I think I lost connection. Maybe I did. Who knows? Yeah, there was Bozo. Was Bozo up there earlier? Okay, Bozo went away, but okay. So here's the last one. Here's the last thought for you today. It brings us to 16 and 17. It's the last of Paul's tips for spiritual health. Okay, it's this. If we, if we focus on, if we look toward, if we, if we see the, the gain and not the pain, this is what he says. This is the second we do not lose heart in this chapter. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. What's that mean? Every time you see me getting older, just know I'm getting bolder on the inside, right? I got nothing to lose. I got nothing to lose. Why would I lose heart now? I'm, I'm toward the end of my laps. I'm, the race is almost over, right? Even though an outward person is perishing, the inward person is getting better. Our light affliction, oh, this is amazing for Paul to say this, which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's the weight at the bottom of the weeble. While we do not look at, Paul didn't say that, I did. Verse 18, while we do not look at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, again, if you had looked at Paul as a young man and you looked at Paul as an older man when he was writing this, his hardships had taken a toll on his body. They had. He had scars on his scars, right? His scars could brag of scars that they had and bandage, bandages on his band-aids on his, you know, on top of other things. He had been in prison more times than he could count. He had been shipwrecked several times that he could count. He had been beaten and left for dead. Um, and all of these things ironically, for being the person that he used to persecute, right? If you think about that for a minute, this was a guy who part of his regret would have been, man, I was a pretty nasty person before the light of Christ came into my life and I did things that I can't undo. And yet, through the process, he would be the very guy now being thrown into prison when he used to be the guy throwing people into prison for their belief system. Do you really think that that guy couldn't relate to people who thought differently than he did? Do you th really think that he was just a guy to shove people off to the side, categorize them, and judge them in Jesus' name? I know he wasn't. His clay pot had been beat up. In fact, he was a guy who uh, several times in his letters had to apologize for his appearance. He said, look, guys, I know I'm not easy on the eyes. <laughs> um, you know I, I know, I know this is coming from a guy who looks like he's been roughed up out in the alley because I kind of was on the way in. And so he's saying here, if I focus on my pains, man, I'm going to lose heart. But if he focuses on the gains, he's like, oh, man. In the last town, they ran us out of town on a rail. But before they did, man, did we reach several people who used to think God hated them and hated everyone who wasn't like them. And they now know that it's not by merit, it's by mercy. They know that. They know it's not by the outward appearance. It's by the inward reality. They know that now. And life has a way of keeping us humble. I think it does. Why? Because there's the humility of our humanity. Again, I've been... Thinking about this so much, falling apart physically can really make you lose heart. It really can. Or it can make you not lose heart. And I, I'm trying to go that route to say, you know what? Actually, the weaker I'm getting physically, and I want to I make up for that gap 
I want, you know, it's like uh, we're a culture, again, that's obsessed with outward appearance and, and ignores so much of the things that really matter. But if you focus on the physical, it'll fade and you'll lose heart. But, but focusing on gains, focusing on gains, focusing on gains, you know, not, not the pains, but the gains and the eternal weight of glory. He says, this thing, this is something so incredible to me. If it wasn't in the Bible, I wouldn't believe it. And even though it is in the Bible, I'm not sure I believe it, but I'm trying. And it says, these things are working for us. It doesn't say it's against us. It says these things are working for us a far greater glory. What's it saying? The, the, the pain is working a even disproportionate gain. So you go, ah, oh, that's a lot of pain. Well, there's a bigger gain. This size pain, this size gain. This size pain, this size gain. And this is what he's saying. Not to make anyone like go, oh, I bring on the pain, Lord. No, that's messed up, okay? What it is is to say, well, you know what? There's no senseless suffering in my life. The picture there is an old-timey scale. I don't know if you've seen these. You know the scales of justice? You've seen that one where it's got uh, this in, in one hand and this in the other, and a bowl on each side and a fulcrum in the middle. That whole idea of a scale like that wasn't a digital scale where I step on it and go, hmm. You know, it, it was that there's something on this side and there's something on that side. And this is what he's saying. He's saying, yeah, there's pain on this side. On this side of eternity, there is pain. Get used to it. You know, it's like pain on this side. What's on that side? Gain. So it's like the weight of pain takes you like this. The weight of gain is far greater. He says it's far greater and eternal weight of glory, which means several things. First of all, pain is temporary. Pain is temporary and gain is eternal. You go, wow, that's amazing. It even says it's disproportionate. So you go, man, that, I, you know when you go into the hospital and they tell you on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, what would you call your pain rate? You know, and you're like, this one goes to 11. Um, you know, I, it's off the chart, you know, and they're like, it's a hangnail, sir. We're going to have to put you over here. And you're like, it's very bad. It's infected, you know, but it's like look, eternal weight of glory. And no matter how much weight is on this side, of eternity in your life, mine, or someone else's. I can look at it and say, you know what it's doing? It's working for you and achieving something because you're receiving something on the other side. And oftentimes I'll hear bad news and I go, man, that is, that is just heavy. That is heavy. I mean, that's, I guess that's a leftover from my hippie days. So heavy, man. You know, but somebody will say something at work and I'm like, oh, that's, that's just heavy news. But that can become that weight in the bottom of something that keeps you stable and keeps you focused here but even better than that it's like that may not even ever make sense here but it's achieving something in eternity and i think about that family and parts that fall off and everything friends that all of the things that you could sum your life up that good and bad he says those things are working for us not against us god is for us not against us and when I think about that, the heart part, that's the part that I want to leave you with, rust and dust and duct tape, you know? And again, when I think about my life, uh, high mileage, <laughs> you know? Um, I'll go off to that, that great uh, parts place in the sky, you know, at some point. But what's great is, I, this would be my hope, is that when I get to heaven, when you get to heaven, that they'd be able to look at us and say, look at this heart. They didn't lose the heart part. <laughs> they never lost the heart part. Through all of that, through all of that, through all of that, all of the things that hurt and, and, and all the rest, that treasure in the, in the jar of clay was preserved and was purified and is, is, is something of value. And that, to me, is what, that's what following Christ is all about. Um, so, honk if something falls off. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the fact that we can go through different things together, but some things we just go through ourselves. And I pray that we would know that on some level, uh, there is a community of people, whether it's here, down the road, somewhere else in our life, uh, 
seen or unseen. There are people who do care, and there are people who do carry these truths uh, this way. Pray that we would be those. And again, that we would have a heart and eyes and ears, mouths, hands, feet, all the parts uh, that we would need to be used of you. And if people misuse or, or abuse or, or uh, uh, misunderstand all those things, Lord, I pray that we would not uh, let that change the fact that we want uh, hearts that are not lost but are found in you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.